Hi, ladies, and welcome back to World War II Part 2. Today we are going to be talking about um, the other front of the war, which is the war in the Pacific. Um, this one will be kind of short. We're just going to go over a few things, which will lead us into our um, last part about the actual war, which will be the atomic bombs that are dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So first of all, we're going to go back um, first and just kind of review a little bit about what happened in 1941. So you um, got a little bit more info on the attack at Pearl Harbor, but just a reminder that that was not the only attack that happened. So in the following days, we were attacked again at different bases in the Pacific. So it was Hawaii, it was Philippines, Guam, um, in Singapore, Wake Island. So this is um, about three to four days after Pearl Harbor, this will continue. And so again, their strategy was to first tar target Pearl Harbor because that's where half of our um, naval fleet was stationed. But then obviously we still had um, military in those other areas. And so once they were able to sort of um, paralyze us in a way because we wouldn't be able to respond um, immediately that gave them access to those natural resources and those areas of Southeast Asia that um, they were looking towards taking over. So a couple significant battles that we're going to touch upon today. The first is the Battle of Midway. So if you remember um, back in the fall when we covered um, imperialism, we did the map activity and the the um, couple of things that you had to identify in the map, those little tiny islands right there in the middle of the Pacific, which are sometimes hard to see. But one of those islands that is called Midway, and, and it's basically midway between North America and Asia, um, this was a significant battle that occurred in 1942. So this is about six months after Pearl Harbor, and this was another um, uh attack, an offensive attack by the Japanese, and they had hoped to destroy the remaining um, f fleet of naval ships that the U.S. had. However, um, that is not what happened. So the U.S. was able to destroy these two carriers, and this actually is associated with um, some of the like code talkers, the Navajo code talkers that we had discussed earlier we were able to break some of their secret codes at that point and had, um, wasn't quite as a surprise of an attack that we, um, uh, that could have happened. So we were able to destroy three of their four carriers. And then after this battle, it becomes a turning point because they're no longer to launch, they're no longer um, have the ability to launch any more offensive operations in the Pacific. So we basically will have them on the defense um, for the remaining part of the war. And even though we're going to be concentrating on our war efforts in preparing for what will be D-Day and Operation Overlord in Europe, doesn't mean that like we just stop everything on the Pacific. It's obviously still um, something that that they have to deal with and we have to be prepared in some way, but most of our resources will be going towards Europe first before the war in the Pacific. One of the things that um, was an issue on this front of the war was um, the Japanese war strategy and how they, um, how they fought the war and how they looked at things a little bit differently than we've been used to. So the first is, um, what are called kamikazes and you may have heard of kamikazes before but these are suicide planes that were used by the japanese and so basically the pilots that um were flying these planes would load them um with as m much weaponry bombs as as they could fit aboard and then deliberately crash them into enemy ships trying to inflict maximum amount of damage to um mainly our aircraft carriers. So a couple like real pictures from um, from that time. You can see it's a little bit grainy, this one, but you can see the kamikaze up here in the top left-hand corner aiming towards one of our battleships. 
this one I think is a really good picture because this is, um, you've got um, our Navy, um, our soldiers up here on an aircraft carrier, basically watching in, you know, probably shock as this plane is literally about to crash into the side of the aircraft carrier. So this was something that, um, that the U S military had never seen before. Um, and part of this comes from the culture of the Japanese. So if you ever get a chance, I took in college a class on, um, the history of Japan. And it's kind of interesting because there a lot of their like military culture goes all the way back to the age of the samurai and the samurai were warriors. And one of the um, things about being a samurai was that you never, you never um, surrendered, you never gave up. And it was more honorable to your family to die in battle than to lose a battle. So, some of the casualties that we're going to see in a moment with um, the last uh, couple of big battles that happened in, in the Pacific. Um, yes, obviously some of that was because of, um, of, of war and of the battle um, itself, but some were actually suicides. There was a high rate of suicides among Japanese soldiers because many um, will commit suicide before being captured by the U.S. or the Allies. So there are two specific battles that we're going to touch upon today. Um, there's more that took place during the war in the Pacific, but these are the two most significant for the U.S. And the first is the Battle of Iwo Jima, which some of you may be familiar with from the picture that's on the slide. Um, that is a very, very famous picture that's now also a statue in Washington, D.C. Um, and this is uh, an island. So first of all, I should go back and say that if you recall from our maps that Japan is a series of islands, right? So we sort of have this strategy of what they call like island hopping, that if we can get into these outer islands, and take over these islands first, um, then, you know, we can make a plan about an, a home island invasion. So the Battle of Iwo Jima is um, one of the bloodiest battles that takes place in the Pacific. There's about 25,000 casualties. So this number um, that is shared with you on the slide is kind of what I'm talking about. So think about this for a second. Out of the 20,700 Japanese soldiers, only 200 survive. Only 200 survive this battle. Um, and again, part of that is like from, you know, of the war um, itself and the battle itself, but some will also be based in the suicide rate that took place. Um, this was a critical base for the U.S. to capture. And you see here the picture of um, the right, the raising of the flag at Mount Suribachi, which is um, basically the United States saying that we have um, defeated the Japanese on this island and they have um, not taken it for ourselves, but for temper, for, for the war um, purposes, we have taken it over and that's um, a good thing. So moving on to the next island, which is Okinawa. So this is the Battle of Okinawa. Okinawa will be the worst of all the battles in terms of casualties. It's the largest um, number of casualties of the Pacific War, not including what will be the atomic bombs. But this is basically the last obstacle to the Allied invasion of the Japanese home island. So this is like the last outer island before they can get into those home islands. There's about 7,600 Americans that were killed and 110,000 Japanese. So again, you see those numbers skyrocket um, based on some of the things I told you before. And so once this is occupied by the U.S. military, then there has to be a decision that's made. And that is where to go from here. How are we going to progress with the war? So we're going to kind of sidestep for a moment um, before we get to this final part of the war and talk about things that happen in the U.S. that will lead us up to using the atomic bombs on Japan. And the, and the first thing, of course, is called the Manhattan Project, which many of you probably learned about in world history last year. Um, but where did this come from? Why was this significant? And what were we trying to accomplish? Well, 
the Manhattan Project is a secret um, program that was developed in the early stages of World War II to develop an atomic bomb. And it was actually initiated by Albert Einstein, which um, I know all of you know he's the He's the really smart guy with the crazy hair, right? So if you didn't know about Albert Einstein's history, um, he was Jewish and he fled from Europe in the 1930s once Hitler took over and he came here to the United States. And in the late 30s, he writes President Roosevelt um, a letter, which if we were in class, this would be a primary source that we would um activity that we would do in class together. But since we're not together, I'm just going to kind of explain what was in this letter. So basically, he warns FDR of the fact that Hitler, remember, part of our cards from our scavenger hunt um, was when the um, the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain basically like hands Czechoslovakia, that part of this, what we call the Sudetenland, um, on a silver platter to Hitler and says, hey, here's, you know, this like great land that you want that's yours. And in his um, uh, playbook of, of appeasement that didn't work out too well. So part of the controversy of that was all of those really rich, min mineral rich um, deposits in that land, specifically uranium, which is what is used to build atomic weaponry. So anyways, um, Einstein will warn FDR that Germany could build, has the potential, and is most likely working from his knowledge on a new type of weapon that will be the most powerful on the face of the earth. Um, and that he suggests that the U.S. should start doing something similar um, because, you know, this could potentially be you know, life-changing and could be very, very bad. So Albert Einstein was much, was very much a pacifist, meaning that he did not believe in war and he did not believe in these types of weapons. However, he knew um, that there would be no way we could defeat um, Hitler if they had this type of weaponry. He believed in the letter he wrote that he believed that they had um, some type of weapon already designed. They just didn't know how to launch it because it was so large and so heavy. So again, that they were kind of on their way of doing this. So FDR took this very seriously and he creates a very, very top secret project. Um, this was only known to um, a handful of people. He asked Robert Oppenheimer, who was a theoretical physicist, to lead the project and he oversaw it from start to finish. And you saw in America the story of us at the very end of when they tested the bomb, um, you know, the guy that played Rob Robert Oppenheimer, but there were other um, scientists involved as well. And so they make some pretty, um, pretty fast um, developments through um, just in a couple of years and developing this bomb. The first time that they field test it is in New Mexico on July 16th, 1945. So this is about three weeks before we actually use the bomb. Um, this happens in a, in the desert in the middle of nowhere. And they do recreate that scene in America, the story of us, but it's called the Trinity test. And the explosion was so much more intense and much larger than they had anticipated. Um, you saw in the recreation and Robert Oppenheimer had said, um, I become death, the destroyer of worlds because it's more powerful than um, he had ever imagined. And um, he felt that, you know, this, this was something that, you know, if this was used, this would be something that would um, do a lot of damage, but also um, end the war. So this picture is a still shot of when the atomic bomb so what happens when an atomic bomb is released, it doesn't actually explode on impact on the earth. It actually explodes midair. So this is when um, it explodes. And this is um, just, what, 0 0.16 seconds after detonation. And so the fireball is about 200 meters wide. Um, this 
exploded windows from 100 miles away. So it would be like, to kind of give you a, an example that you can relate to, it would be like if an atomic bomb went off here, but windows were exploding in Lima, Ohio, or north of Detroit. So that's how intense of an explosion it was and what um, we're talking about in terms of um, impact. So I'm going to kind of end it there because in our next um, PowerPoint slash lecture, we're going to look at um, some of the options that the United States had, not just using the atomic bombs, but sort of like the four or five things that they were um, discussing in, in trying to end the war and why they went with the atomic bomb and, of course, the ramifications and consequences of that. So as always, um, if you have any questions, you can email me. Um, you can put a question down in the comment section of um, our classroom, Google Classroom post, and I will be happy to help you. So I will see you next time.